All right, so can everybody hear me? Does that work? Perfect, then let me start screen sharing here. And now you should also be able to see my slides. Yes. Okay, and now they're maximized. Okay, well, I still uh, I think I should still spend like two minutes for everybody to join before I really start. So uh, maybe let me start by thanking the organizers for inviting me. It's, uh, it's really always a, a great pleasure to, to speak at space. And, uh, and well, usually it's a, it's a great pleasure to be in India at space. Um, now uh, we're all sitting at home, at least I'll have some nice Indian curry for dinner later. So uh, as a well, as a title for the talk uh, for this tutorial, I chose an introduction to letter-based camps. And what I'm planning to do in this tutorial is that I'll first give a bit of an introductory talk, which will take maybe about an hour. Um, and that is not very experimental. I think uh, th that's all fine. The second part is a bit more experimental. So um, I want to make sure that participants actually get their hands dirty and write some code. So I prepared a bit of a uh, programming exercise for, well, obviously related to lattice-based camps. And my idea would be that for that, um, we move to the Discord channel for questions and for, for more discussions, but that will be after the talk. Now, for this talk, I would usually start with a general introduction to post-quantum cryptography, but I coordinated with Patrick Longa, who will be speaking right after me. And uh, actually, he said that he would uh, cover more generally the whole area of post-quantum cryptography and that it would maybe make sense for me to dive in directly. Well, I'll do that more or less. Um, I would like to start with, with one slide, uh, which is on the NIST post-quantum competition. So I could imagine, I mean, Stepan already mentioned that I, I'm involved in four of the finalists. I'll come to the finalists in a bit. Um, there's since, well, the, the call went out in 2016 and 27, late 2017. Um, NIST uh, posted, well, had a deadline for proposals for post-quantum schemes that probably eventually replace the asymmetric cryptography that we're using today. And what you see on this picture is an overview that uh, Jacob Alper and Sheriff, one of the um, NIST folks who's, who are running this competition, posted a few days after the deadline as an overview of what they had received. And I really like this overview because you can tell so many stories just based on this one picture. So you see that there is various different um, categories here in which proposals have been made for post-quantum schemes. The one thing that um, I would like to focus your attention on for this talk is that you see that the biggest number is sitting here, this uh, 24, which is lattice-based key exchange. Um, there's multiple reasons. I would say mainly two reasons why I believe there have been so many lattice-based um, key exchange proposals, and I'll also come back to what key exchange exactly means. Um, I'll also come back to those two reasons. But just, um, so in this NIST competition, there were in the end 69 complete and proper submissions. So this one still lists 80, but some of those submissions did not fulfill the submission requirements, so they were removed from the beginning. And out of those, 24 are lattice-based camps. Now, in the meantime, quite a bit has happened in the NIST competition, and um, most, well, there were two rounds where NIST, well, narrowed down the field of, um, of competitors, and um, Originally, the plan was to make an announcement for round two at Real World Crypto in early January in 2019. But maybe you still remember that in um, early January 2019, the whole US government was um, shut down. And uh, so NIST wasn't actually allowed to work and they were not allowed to make any announcements at Real World Crypto. So the announcement happened slightly later. It was actually in late January. And what happened there is that they chose um, a total of 17 encryption and key agreement schemes. So these key exchange schemes that you saw on the previous slide. And they chose a total of nine signature schemes. So they were out of the 69 that were there from the beginning, there were only 26 left in round two. And again, what you can see here is that the biggest uh, number 
is on the lattice-based encryption key agreement key exchange area. You also see seven code-based ones. Now, you would feel like, okay, then code-based is extremely close to lattice-based, but then um, round three happened, and well, List again said that they would make an announcement in June 2020, and then I guess a global pandemic happened, something like that. So they announced it slightly later. And the interesting thing in this competition is that they chose um, two, well, two broad categories that, that uh, round three candidates can be in. They can either be finalists, and those are schemes um, out of which I think, if I understand correctly, NIST expects to pick some to standardize at the end of round three or after round three. Um, and we see that there's three letters based and only one code based um, key agreement scheme in this category. Um, there's also the alternate schemes. And essentially the, the idea there is that um, this might end up deciding that, um, well, if some get broken of the finalists in very specific ways, then the alternate schemes might be drop-in replacement, or um, these alternate schemes are schemes that are maybe not that well understood yet, but really interesting. So this might want to come back to them at a later point and standardize them later. There's also a category where, while they're very well understood and uh, you could maybe standardize them even very soon, but they don't really work well as a drop-in replacement in all application scenarios. So an example would be these symmetric crypto-based signatures. They're very conservative, um, but they're pretty big signatures, so they might not work everywhere. Anyway, you also see that there's another two lattice-based CHEMs in this alternate scheme. So again, lattice-based CHEMs are the biggest category. Now, when I'm saying key exchange or key agreements, um, we should talk about what that really means for this in this competition. And what NIST meant when they posted, or what Jacob Elprin Sheriff meant when he posted this overview table, when he said key exchange is actually key encapsulation. And what I wrote down on this slide is the syntax of a key encapsulation mechanism. And so it's a, it's a three tuple of algorithms. Um, key generation, encapsulation, and decapsulation, where key generation um, generates a public key and a secret key. Encapsulation receives the public key as input and generates um, a shared key K and a ciphertext C. And the decapsulation receives a ciphertext and a secret key and produces a shared key K. Now, usually when you hear key exchange, um, you actually, in your, in your mind, at least I do, um, you complete it to Diffie-Hellman key exchange. So it might be an interesting question to understand if this is, well, just Diffie-Hellman key exchange written in a different way or if it isn't. And spoiler alert, it isn't. So let's, just to understand how this is different from Diffie-Hellman, take a look at Diffie-Hellman. I'm sure everybody here has seen this picture or a very, very similar picture. So the traditional picture of Diffie-Hellman is that you have Alice and Bob, and they want to agree on a shared key. So in some group, um, Alice computes G to the A. It needs to be a group which um, is finite and abelian, um, and where the discrete logarithm problem is hard. So Alice computes G to the A, Bob computes G to the B. They send those values over the channel to each other, and then they compute, can both compute G to the AB which is the same as G to the BA, which in the end is the, is the same key. As I said, you've seen this picture probably many, many, many times before. There's one thing that I think you all knew, but you never really um, noticed that you knew. And that is that you can swap these two arrows. So in other words, it doesn't matter if Bob sends first or if Alice sends first, or if they just send at the same time. That is precisely the difference to a key encapsulation mechanism. If we look at the same picture in a chem setup, then, well, the encapsulation on this side here needs to know the public key. So in other words, Bob can only send after Bob has received the public key from Alice. So the, the, the sort of non-interactive characteristic of Diffie-Hellman is lost. You get an inherently interactive um, procedure where 
one party needs to wait for the input from the other party. Now, what I'm saying here in the title that these chems are as close as you can get to Diffie-Hellman in a post-quantum world, this is slightly lying. There is one proposal which you could use as a drop-in replacement for Diffie-Hellman. So it really has this non-interactive kind of behavior. And that proposal is called Seaside. Now, the Seaside proposal is not in the NIST competition. And if you look at the date when it was published, it becomes directly obvious why. It was only invented after the deadline for submissions to the NIST competition. Also, there is quite some debate about what parameters give you what kind of security, in particular against quantum attackers. So there have been multiple papers been published recently. Um, there were two at Eurocrypt this year. I think there was another one in Eurocrypt last year, um, making giving very different estimates depending on what kind of quantum attacker you're assuming, what kind of capabilities you, you assume for a quantum computer. And um, so it's, Let's say it's very young. It definitely wants some more research. Um, it's not super efficient and it's not in the NIST competition. So we shouldn't expect this to be standardized. So basically what we can assume is that it makes sense for, for us as cryptographers that if we're designing protocols on a higher level to not think anymore in terms of Diffie-Hellman key exchanges, but to think protocols in terms of CAMs. And that brings us to, well, the, the main part of this talk, which is lattice-based camps. Now, I promised you that I would give you two reasons why I believe um, lattice-based camps are the category of NIST post-quantum submissions, uh, which has most submissions. And one of those reasons is actually a paper that uh, we published in 2016. So the paper was called uh, Post Quantum Key Exchange in New Hope. It was at Usenix Security. And well, basically, what we proposed was a lattice based CAM. And that was considerably more efficient than things that had been published before, had new security analysis, was multiple contributions in this paper. Now, this paper got quite a bit of attention, and that was um, mainly because Google decided to use this CAM in a post-quantum experiment of TLS. So um, at some point we were contacted by Adam Langley by Google, and he asked, hey, I would like to set up, well, a variant of well, instantiation of TLS, which uses post-quantum key exchange in parallel to the existing elliptic curve key exchange. And if you could use New Hope, and of course we said, yeah, that, that would actually be great, right? So um, they started this, this experiment in 2016 and um, wrote a blog post about it and in there said that they're indebted to Adam Alkim, Leo Ducat, Thomas Pöppelmann and myself, who developed New Hope. Now, today, four years later, there's quite a few companies who have started experimenting with different post-quantum algorithms, in particular with post-quantum CAMs. But in 2016, Google was one of the first, maybe the first to do it. And of course, Google is very big. So if they do this, they are maybe the, the only company in the world controlling at the same time a browser and quite a bit of internet server architecture so that they control both endpoints um, of TLS connections on the web. So they could actually do this. And well, then several other companies also followed up and, and also implemented New Hope. So for example, Isara, company based in, I think, Canada, um, they also started selling something based on New Hope. They had a uh, Isara speed optimized version of New Hope. Um, and also Infineon uh, started making the first contactless smart card, which, which also implemented a variant of New Hope. Now, this is maybe not terribly surprising because Thomas Pöppelmann, one of the uh, New Hope authors, is working at Infineon. So, but still, they, they actually turned this into a prototype smart card. So in 2016, which was about a year before the NIST submissions for that, uh, or the, the, the deadline by NIST, 
um, it was just a few months before NIST issued the call for proposals, lattice-based key exchange or lattice-based CAMs were a bit in the news and uh, well, I guess that many groups looked at this and felt like, okay, we can actually do better than New Hope and um, we should be submitting this to, to NIST. Also as the New Hope authors, we were contacted by NIST and NIST said, hey, it would actually be nice if you could submit New Hope to, uh, to the NIST competition, which we did. There's another reason that why I think that lattice-based CAMs um, really are the biggest category. And that is because it's a really interesting design space to look at. So there's many trade-offs to make. And um, when you look at multiple different lattice-based CAMs, it's, it's not easily possible to say, oh yeah, clearly one is better than the other, just because one makes different trade-offs than the other. And you can easily argue for one of the other candidates being better just by slightly changing the metric of what you believe is more important. And what I want to do in the remainder of this talk is to um, give you a bit of an idea of what this uh, this landscape or this uh, this design space for lattice-based camps looks like, what kind of design decisions you need to make, and of course start by well the underlying principles, the underlying math mathematical problems that we're actually working with. So let's start with the mathematical basics. So here's the problem that underlies, well, most of, um, of these lattice-based chem proposals. So we start by saying we have a matrix with entries in ZQ. Now Q is typically a small number. It might be prime, it might not be prime, doesn't have to be prime. Some proposals it is, some it isn't. And when I say small, it's something that definitely fits into one machine register. You can think of something like 11 bits, 12 bits, 13 bits, something like that. So it's not the kind of big number that you might be used to from RSA modular arithmetic or elliptic curve modular arithmetic. It's much, much more manageable than that. So you have this matrix where the entries are chosen uniformly random modulo Q. And then we need a noise distribution. Now, a noise distribution essentially gives us values that are small and centered around zero. So you can think about a distribution that gives you something like minus two, minus one, zero, one, two, with those values in a certain uh, probability. And um, then we compute samples of the form A times S plus E, where E is a, a sampled according to this noise distribution. So we, we, we have a secret vector S and we multiply it by the matrix. Now, if you didn't have the noise added to it, it would be trivial when you give this out to recover the secret value S. I mean, basically you invert the matrix A um, or you do Gaussian elimination, something like that, and you obtain this. And this error vector is what makes the so-called learning with errors problem hard. The learning with errors problem has two variants, the search variant, which is to find a secret vector S or yeah. Um, and then the decision vector, which is that when you're given A and samples of the form AS plus E to distinguish that from uniformly random. There is a variant of this learning with errors and that is learning with rounding. Um, in learning with rounding, what we're doing is we Again, we take a, a matrix, which is uniform, again, entries modulo Q. And now we again, we have a secret vector S. We again multiplying A by S. But now instead of adding noise, we're just basically dropping the least significant bits. Where dropping means we're rounding off, right? So we're rounding to a smaller modulus P, uh, P smaller than Q. And so we're basically withholding some information about this again from, from an attacker. And again, we have the search version, which is to find S, and we have the decision version, which is to distinguish uh, those samples from uniformly random samples. Okay, now this is the, the very basic starting point, but the problem is that if you're designing um, lattice-based CAMs on plain LWE, then you're getting a very large public key. So essentially the problem is that you um, you get matrices which are, well, sort of quadratic 
in security parameter to some extent and um, and in the number of bits that you want to transmit. So it's it's a bit it's a bit annoying to to work with. It's not terribly inefficient. So there is one list candidate which is one of the alternate schemes in round three that is FrodoCam. And FrodoCam really uses unstructured lattices. So it's maybe a factor of five to ten less efficient than what I'm going to show you in a moment, which is to use um, structured matrices. So this matrix A that we have, I said it's completely uniformly sampled in LWE. But um, everything becomes much more efficient if we say, okay, let's just introduce a cyclic structure to this matrix, where, for example, you're obtaining a row um, by just shifting the previous row by one or rotating it, right? Where you need to come up with a suitable definition of rotation. But if you're doing, and, and if you do this, then you actually end up working on polynomials instead of matrices and vectors. And the polynomial ring that you're working with sort of chooses how you define rotation in this matrix. So for example, New Hope um, used a ring of the form um, ZQ of X modular X to the N plus one. So that would be um, a mega cyclic form where when you shift or when you rotate, then the value that falls out on one side gets a minus sign and goes in on the other side. Um, you can also choose x to the n minus one, which is actually a real rotation of, uh, of rows. Um, or you can use something like, for example, as a reduction polynomial, x to the n minus x minus one. And entry prime does that with an emphasis on the fact that n is also prime and q is prime. And then what you can also do, and that is what Kyber and Sabre, two finalists of, in the NIST competition do, is they say, well, we choose, we fix our n, and then we choose, we, we work with these polynomials, but we actually work with small dimension matrices where the entries are polynomials. And well, when you do this, as I said, you end up performing arithmetic on polynomials or vectors of polynomials, and no longer on, on plain matrices and vectors over, um, over ZQ. And that makes arithmetic much more efficient. It also in particular makes the sizes that you need to transmit considerably smaller. And, and that's in many contexts really important. So how do we build a camp? I will, for the rest of the talk, um, already use polynomial notation. So everything um, on the slides now, so all the uh, bold face characters are going to be polynomials now. And we just go with these polynomials as computing. For example, here, this AS plus E would be corresponding to taking the matrix times the secret vector plus the noise. So this slide here is probably the most important slide of this whole slide deck because it should give you an idea of the very basic underlying idea of how lattice-based key encapsulation works. So what we do is we have Alice sampling not just E, but also the secret vector S or the secret polynomial S from this noise distribution. So S and E are now polynomials modulo Q. So all efficients are modulo Q, but they're special. They're small modulo Q. So N centered around zero. So again, think of something like minus two, minus one, zero, one, two. And then Alice computes A S plus E, where this A is a uniformly random polynomial and sends that B over to Bob. Bob does the same. So Bob samples S prime and E prime, again, both from this noise distribution and computes um, A S prime plus E prime, let's call that U, and sends U over to Alice. And now what Alice does is she takes whatever she received from Bob, so this U, multiplies by her secret value S and gets A S S prime plus E prime S. What Bob does is Bob takes, well, it's so far everything is still symmetric. Bob receives this value B and multiplies by his secret S prime and gets A S S prime plus E S prime. Now, because we chose all the E and E prime and S and S prime as small value centered around zero. Also these products, E prime S and E S prime are small 
So all the coefficients are small-ish at least. So in other words, what Alice and Bob have, this V and this V prime, are approximately the same. They're not the same because these two values here in the end are different, but because they're small and different, you're still well approximately the same. All right, so that is the, the, the very basic underlying idea that you do something like a, a noisy Diffie-Hellman, where at the end, on both ends, you have something very similar. Now we need to turn this into something where in the end, Alice and Bob actually have the same value out at the end. And let me show you how we can do this. So on this slide, what you see is exactly the same as on the previous slide, except that I added a whole lot of space so that we can fill in gaps here and explain what we need to do to, well, end up with the same key on both sides, at least with high probability. Let me start here while filling in the gaps with sort of the elephant in the room. I said that this A is uniformly random. So, so far throughout this talk, the A sort of fell out of the sky. We have no idea where it came from. It needs to come from somewhere though. I'll come back to this a bit later in the talk, but for the moment we do the following. So Alice just samples a random seed. So just 256 bit seed and then expands the C through an extendable output function. Just think about, think of a hash function with a very long output. And then takes that, um, that output of the hash function, parses it into a polynomial. I mean, the output is a bit string. What we need is a uniformly random polynomial, but you can imagine that if you just have enough random, uniformly looking random bits, um, that you can turn this into a uniformly uh, distributed polynomial. So that gives us our A. And then what Alice does is Alice is going to send that seed over to Bob and um, Bob can do the same. Bob can take that seed, expand it through the extendable output function, parse it and obtain the same A. The nice thing here is that we don't need to transmit the whole A. We only need to transmit a 32 byte or 256 bit seed, which is much, much more efficient in terms of bandwidth usage. Okay, so now that that is sorted out, how do we deal with the fact that Alice and Bob still get only a V and V prime that are only approximately the same? Well, what we're doing is we have Bob choose a key. Let's call it K. And we let Bob encode that key into a polynomial. I'll come back on the next slide into how you're doing this. And now we're just taking our, our V and we add the key to it. And that we send over to Alice. Now, before we continue, that's not exactly what we're sending over to Alice. We need to modify this V here. The V also needs to get some additional noise, which is also sampled from the noise distribution. Otherwise, at least the proofs don't go through. Potentially things become insecure. So we need to make sure that this V is also protected by some additional noise because we're sending this over the channel here. Okay, but this is a, this is another just small value, so it, it's not going to be much of a problem that this is a bit more noisy. Now what Alice does, Alice receives this uh, receives this k, um, receives this c, sorry, and subtracts the v prime. So that means that Alice gets something that is approximately k, because. Well, uh, the C was V plus K. We know that V prime is approximately V. So after we subtract something that is approximately V, we get approximately K. So we get K plus something really small. And now, depending on what this encode function does, we can come up with an extract function, which uses this noisy K um, to obtain the final, uh, final key mu, which is then used by both, by both parties. Okay, so this, as I wrote it down, is LPR encryption. Uh, Lubashevsky packet regif, I think from 2009, but I would need to look that up. Might be 2011, might also be 2010. So Lubashevsky packet regif came up with this encryption scheme, except that what I did here is I wrote it as a key encapsulation. So in the encryption scheme, this K wouldn't be chosen at random, it would just be a message that gets encoded into the polynomial here. The one thing that is different is that um, I added explicitly how this generation of the polynomial A is being done. Okay, 
So how about this encode and extract? Well, um, what we're going to do is we will map n bits of key to n coefficients of our polynomial. So we just take one bit and encode one bit into one coefficient. And we know that what we're getting out of it is a noisy version. So we get um, our coefficient plus something small. So in other words, if we encode our coefficient into something big, then we can afterwards check if we're well closer to zero or closer to one. Very concretely, what we're doing is that if we want to encode a zero bit, we map this to zero. And if we have a one bit, we encode this to Q half, which modulo Q is the maximum distance from, from zero that you can have. And now the noise is going to affect only the low bits. And in the extract function, what we're doing is we just check, are we closer to zero? In other words, are we between minus Q fourth and Q fourth if we map this to an interval between minus Q half and Q half? Or are we in the, in the other interval, which is sort of uh, the, the big values? And depending on that, we just uh, decode the bit to zero or we decode the bit to one. And that works really well. There is one issue in this, and that is, well, how we choose the noise. So if we choose the noise too small, let's say we just choose the noise to always be zero, this protocol becomes completely insecure because we can, as I said earlier, we can just invert the matrix. We can just obtain the secret. The noise is the only thing that basically gives us security in this. If we make the noise too big, however, then these terms here, um, these, let me go back to the previous slide. These terms E prime S and E S prime also become too big. And we might not be similar enough anymore in what we're decoding. So then we may get decoding errors and then we end up with actually different keys. So what you see here is that we get a trade-off between security on the one hand, security of the underlying hard problem and failure probability of this, where even if both parties stick to the rules and choose all noise according to the rules, they're still, depending on what the noise distribution is, there is a chance that this fails. And we'll come back to that later at the top. Now, let's look at this design space. Like what kind of decisions can we make here um, to trade off size, speed, security, failures? Well, before, actually, actually before doing this, um, let's realize one problem that we still have. And that is that this is only passively secure, what we're doing here. There is a reason for this. And that is that, of course, if Alice keeps reusing her public key, so this AS plus E that Alice chose, then what Bob can do is Bob can send an AS prime plus E prime where the noise is not chosen according to the noise distribution, but where the noise is chosen in a way that, for example, um, the key encapsulation fails exactly if some bit is set in Alice's secret. So in other words, Bob, by well, choosing ciphertexts appropriately, can obtain information about the long-term secret by Alice. And that would exactly mean that, that we don't have active security. And we learn the secret from failures or non-failures for specially crafted ciphertexts. Now, there is a way to address this. And this is what most of the NIST candidates do. This is the Fujisaki Okamoto transform. And I'm only sketching the idea here. It looks a bit scary, but it's actually the idea is not terribly, uh, terribly hard. So the idea is that you forcing Bob to behave properly. And the way that you're doing this is that you're saying, okay, so first of all, Alice generates the key just as before, but now Bob uh, needs to pay, pick a random X and then expand this into two values. Let me read a key K and some coins where the coins determine all of the um, non-random, uh, all, all of the randomness that happens in encryption. So all of the sampling of secrets, all of the sampling of the noise comes out of these coins. So basically we just expand these coins through uh, a PRF 
into, uh, into what we need there. And now we encrypt this. So we encrypt the value X with all randomness generated deterministically from the coins. So because it's generated deterministically from the coins, if Bob does it like that, Bob can't cheat anymore. Bob can't choose um, the secret and the noise anymore. It has to fall now out of this deterministic procedure. Of course, you could say, well, nobody forces Bob to use this deterministic procedure. But this is the trick in this transform we do. Because what Alice does, after Alice decrypts, Alice gets this x prime, which, if everything worked well, is the same as x. Um, then Alice can also expand that into um, the k prime and coins prime, which, again, if everything works well, is the same as k and coins. And now Alice runs exactly this encryption routine with the coins and checks if she gets the same ciphertext. If she gets the same ciphertext, she knows that Bob behaved honestly and generated all of the secrets and noise according to the rules and then accepts. If she gets a different ciphertext, she knows that Bob has done something funny and just rejects. So this is the idea how we use the passively secure encryption scheme that we had on the previous slide for an actively secure camp. Okay. Now for the design space. First thing in the design space is that we can actually do something different than what I just showed you. And that would be to use the entry approach. So the entry approach is historically the first lattice-based encryption scheme that we're still using today. It was proposed in the 90s and it uses two parameters, Q and P, where P is three. Uh, so you could maybe parameterize that more, but P is just three. And then what Entru does is it generates um, two polynomials in this polynomial ring that we're working with and inverts F. It inverts F modulo Q and it inverts F modulo P, so modulo three. And if it's not invertible, then, well, you basically try again until you have a polynomial that is invertible modulo Q and modulo P. Then you compute a public key, which is P times FQ times G, where FQ is exactly this inverse here, modulo Q, and G is the other polynomial that you sampled. And uh, the secret key is F and FP. And now you encrypt. Where encryption says you take a message M and you map that to um, the ring RQ with small coefficients, and more specifically, with coefficients, well, modulo three, so minus one, zero, and one. And then we sample a random small coefficient polynomial R, also in this ring, and then we compute R times H plus M, where H is the public key, so we just take the public key, multiply by a random small coefficient polynomial, and we add M. Okay, so how do we decrypt? Well, we take the E that we're receiving and we multiply it by F our one component of the secret key. This is the same as, well, multiplying by R times H plus M, which is exactly what E is. And now we know that H is P times FQ times G. And because we're doing these computations modulo Q, we see that F times FQ is one. So what we're getting is PRG plus F times M, because the F times FQ becomes just one. And now we can just take this value here, multiply by FP modulo P. The first component modulo P vanishes and the second mod, uh, component modulo P gives us exactly M. And then we have decrypted. Why would we do all of this? Well, it is asymptotically weaker than the ring LWE approach that I showed you before. It was also not really built with asymptotic guarantees in mind. It was built with um, concrete security for concrete parameters in mind. It does have a slower key generation because you need to compute these inverses, but it has faster encryption and decryption. So if you're using this in um, an actively secure scenario where you can reuse the key many, many times, it might overall become more efficient. Okay. 
for the design space, there's actually one big decision that you need to make. And that is when we work with this polynomial ring, I already said before that essentially we can make different choices what ring we're using, or in other words, what kind of structure we're allo allowing into this matrix. And while what all of the NIST proposals do in some way, except for Frodo, which is non-structured, is to use a polynomial ring of, this, um, of the type ZQ of X modulo F, where F typically has a degree between 512 and 1024. Q is typically either a prime or it's a power of two. So specifically, give you some examples. Uh, the entry proposal chooses Q to be a power of two and chooses F to be X to the N minus one. That's what I already mentioned in the previous slide and N is prime. Second option, what Saber does, it chooses Q to be a power of two, chooses F to be X to the N plus one where N is a power of two. Round five, chooses Q to be a power of two. So Q, uh, round five is no longer in the NIST competition, but it's still, um, there's a few round two candidates that are added here to, to show you like what the design space looks like. Chooses um, the N plus first cyclotomic polynomial as F and then N plus one being prime. Then you have um, the two N cyclotomic polynomial, which is X to the N plus one for New Hope, Kyber and Black. So N is two to the M and uh, we have Q being prime. Then we have the fifth option, which is that Q is prime and F is irreducible um, as X to the N minus X minus one where N is prime and that would be an N true prime. Now, which should you choose? It's actually, uh, uh, ah, there's, there's a sixth option actually. Unfortunately, three bears is also no longer in the competition, but three bears works, instead of using a polynomial ring, works on large integers instead of polynomials. So you could also even do that with some care. So there's no proof that any of these options is more or less secure. So there's no reduction saying that if you can break a scheme using one, then you can definitely also break another one, but not the other way around. There is some advertisement by the Andrew Prime submission saying that there is less structure in their ring and that that would be good for security. Um, the fastest arithmetic pretty clearly um, is for the options chosen for Near Hope and Kyber. And that is because in there, they're chosen explicitly to support multiplication of polynomials through something called the number theoretic transform, which is, ex well, it's the Fourier transform over finite fields, and it's just giving you the fastest arithmetic, pretty much the fastest multiplication um, of the polynomials in these frames. Okay, so second question that uh, you might want to deal with when designing a lattice space 10, and that is if you want to work with ring LWE, do you want to work with this polynomial ring directly? Or do you want to use this module approach that Kyber and Sabre are using, where you make a polynomial somewhat smaller. So for example, you choose N equals 256 for uh, Kyber, Saber, and also three bears. And then you work with small dimension matrices and vectors over this ring. So this modular LWE, at least with a straightforward encoding of messages, um, encrypts shorter messages than ring LWE. So that's on the sort of that's losing a little bit and it's gaining a little bit because it eliminates a bit of the structure that you have in ring LWE. So you could imagine attacks that work against um, ring LWE that become considerably harder at least against module LWE. From an implementer's point of view, um, it's really nice to work with module LWE because you have for different security levels, you have just one polynomial ring to work with. So all other proposals, in order to um, get different security levels, they basically change their polynomial rings, so they go for a higher dimension. And for um, Sabre and Kyber, and also for, uh, for three bears, what you're doing is you fix your polynomial ring once, you optimize arithmetic in this one ring, and then while well, you put smaller or bigger matrices and vectors over it, which is essentially just changing some 
uh, loop constants uh, through a, through a config file. So there's no much, not much additional optimization needed to to get different security uh, for those schemes. The third option is what? How do you choose this noise distribution? So I said it needs to be small. It needs to be centered around zero, but there's actually um, quite a bit of decision to be making, and that is because while well, the noise controls pretty much the security of the scheme, so you get with more noise, you get more security for this underlying hard problem, but you also get a higher failure probability for decryption. So this three main choices to make when choosing a noise distribution. One is if you want to have very narrow noise or if you want to have wide noise. So as a narrow noise, one example would be to just choose minus one, zero, one, which I would consider not very conservative. Um, you can, of course, choose wider noise, but then you need either a bigger queue to work with, which makes all of your uh, ciphertexts and public keys bigger and potentially arithmetic slower. Or you get more failures, which well causes other problems. Um, then you want to choose if you actually well for the for the secrets you need to pick some distribution, but for the noise for this error terms e that I was adding, um, you could decide to just not use them and instead use this learning with rounding, where you're just well dropping a few low bits. Now. Learning with errors is considered more conservative because then the noise terms are independent of the actual um, message that you're encrypting. Whereas if you're rounding off, it's inherently what you're dropping off there is not independent. Uh, learning with rounding is a bit easier to implement because you don't need any noise sampling. Well, you still need to sample the secret, but you don't need to sample noise. And learning with rounding gives you somewhat more uh, compact public key and ciphertext. And then the third choice is if you want a fixed weight or not. So what you can do, and what some schemes do, is they say, um, for example, we choose the noise to be minus one zero one. So we choose really narrow noise, and we fix the number of non-zero entries in our noise. Now that is a bit harder to sample because you can't just sample all the coefficients independently. And then usually what you're doing is you start with a vector that has this number of ones and minus ones at the beginning and then the zeros behind and then you randomly permute this vector which works it's no problem but if you do this naively you end up leaking information about the secrets through timing there's some ways to do this securely but it's from an implementation point of view it's maybe a bit annoying and maybe a bit risky if implemented by non-experts to do the big advantage of this is that if you want to get really low failure probability, or if you want to maybe even get zero failure probability, then it's much more efficient to do this because it's much easier to derive a bounds on, um, on, the, on the failure probability basically and, and potentially get it down to zero. Now talking about failure probability, um, the next choice is do you actually allow failures and at what, um, uh, with what probability do you allow failures? There's two of the lattice-based chems still in the competition that do not have any failures. That's Entro and Entro Prime. And the advantage is obvious. It's, uh, it becomes easier to do the CCA transform because you need to have, it becomes much easier to prove, it becomes easier to deal with if you know that if everybody behaves honestly, things don't fail. There is a bit of a disadvantage, which is that you need either less noise as we saw before, and potentially even fixed weight noise, which well lowers the security of the underlying hard problem, or you need to increase Q, which gives you bigger public keys and ciphertexts. If we want a CAM that has only passive security, so if we don't want this active security through the Fujisaki Okamoto transform, then we can go the other way. We can, for example, say a failure probability of two to the minus 30 so one in a billion is totally fine. Two to the minus 30 is by no means cryptographically negligible. But if things fail, you may at, at most learn something about a secret key that will never be used again. So there's not much of a problem. And if we do this, we can well either boost the security by choosing larger noise, or we can use it to reduce the size of public key and ciphertext. 
if we want active security, then we need negligible failure probability, cryptographically negligible. Because otherwise, in this attack that I sketched earlier, where Bob was trying to cheat and choose larger noise, um, Bob can actually even obtain failures with non-negligible chance by behaving honestly and learn something about Alice's key. And of course, this is something that would break active security, so we can't, we can't do this. We need at least negligible uh, failure probability there. Okay, so now for the, for the next item on this uh, design space, and that one is actually the one item that I think by now has been pretty much sorted out. So remember this random, uniformly random A that we had on this uh, overview slide where we multiplied A times S plus E, which needed to come from somewhere. Well, if you write a paper about this and don't need to implement anything, um, you just say, let A be a uniformly random matrix over RQ and you're done, um, or over ZQ. Um, the problem, of course, is if you implement this, then uniformly random matrices, well, they need to come from somewhere. Before we published the new whole paper, the standard thing that people did implementing this kind of exchange was they just fixed it once. So basically the designers just said, well, here's the A that everybody uses. That may be fine. There is a bit of an issue generally with designers choosing A because you could put a backdoor into this A. And this is actually possible. This is not just hypothetical. You can create A in a way that it looks uniformly random to everyone, um, but that you have a backdoor that allows you to really decrypt um, all of the, the key exchanges and recover the keys. So what you would need to do is that when you're choosing it, you need to, to convince everybody that you chose it in a way that you don't have such a backdoor that there are methods that do this. Uh, they're typically called nothing up my sleeves uh, methods. But also if you put 10 cryptographers in a room to discuss this, you get at least 11 opinions about it. And it's really hard to convince everybody in a way that everybody's happy in the end. And it's, it's a nasty discussion. However, even if you manage to convince everybody that you're doing this in the right way, there is another issue. And that is that, well, Imagine that the underlying hard problem is not as hard as we believe today, which is totally possible. So that means that attacks will get somewhat better over the years, but maybe they're not like getting better to the extent where they're completely trivial. So let's say somebody can run an attack that costs two to the 80. Two to the 80 is what many people believe big secret services can do, but can't do just like several times a day, just like nothing. But now what they can do is they can do once a huge computation of say two to the 80 that depends only on the parameter A, which in the traditional setting is shared by everyone. And then use this pre-computation to break all key exchanges. That is at the moment, if you choose big parameters infeasible today, but well, if the attacks improve, that might be possible. So that is very much for those of you who know the logjam attack, that is very much in the spirit of that attack. And what we proposed in New Hope and what now actually all NIST candidates do is that you choose a fresh A every single time. So Alice picks the seed, expands the seed, sends the seed over, makes it part of, of the public key. If you wanna cache it, you can cache it for an hour, say, and then somebody doing this massive computation can break all of the key exchanges of this one hour of this one user which, well, if it's a very valuable user, maybe you do, but then at least not everybody else is at risk. Next item on the list of design spaces. Do we use error correcting codes? So here's the idea why we might wanna do this. Um, most of these ring, or all of the ring LWE and ring learning with error schemes, they use a polynomial ring where the polynomials have more than 256 coefficients. And that is simply because they need a dimension which is large enough to make the underlying hard problems hard enough. So let's say we have something like, I don't know, 1,024 coefficients for high security, maybe 512 for low security, something like that. Then we only really need to encrypt messages of 256 bits because the only thing that we really want to do with a CAM is to transport a key and even post-quantumly, for a symmetric key, we really only need 256 bits. 
So that means that we have coefficients left over, which we could use for something, right? And we can. We can use them to basically encode our, ma our message with an error correcting code, which expands these 256 bits of message, and then encrypt that error corrected message. And then when on the side of Alice, we're, we're decrypting, and there is maybe one coefficient where the noise is just too big and we're, we're making a mistake, we can use the error correcting code to correct it, and thereby we can lower the failure probability of that scheme. This is what New Hope did in a very, very simple threshold decoding. This was basically just encode one coefficient, uh, one a key bit into four coefficients in a very trivial, straightforward way. Um, luck and round five, both not in round three of this competition anymore, um, they employed somewhat more advanced error correcting codes. And they can correct more errors. They obtain smaller public key and ciphertext. That's all great. Um, the disadvantage of this approach is that it's more complex to implement. And in particular, these codes are tricky to implement without leaking through timing. All right, next item on the list. Do we want active security? I've already mentioned before that, you know, for example, if we don't want active security, we could make the public key and ciphertext smaller or, well, because we can use a higher failure probability, all of these discussions. And what Google used in their TLS experiment New Hope did not have active security. It was just the, the rather straightforward passive security um, key encapsulation mechanism. So what you could do is you could, for example, have one passively secure version if you don't need active security, and um, which, well, that typically means that you combine it with signatures for authentication. Or you can say, well, if you need active security, then you use the following parameters with the Fujisaki Okamoto transform to get an active, actively secure version. There's advantages and disadvantages either way. So the advantages of um, a passive security only version is that because you can accept higher failure probability, you can make it more compact, as I mentioned. Um, it is simpler to implement. You don't need to write this code for the CCA transform. And um, you also get more flexibility for the secret and noise generation because it doesn't have to follow this deterministic approach anymore where everybody needs to use the same PRF um, to generate the secrets at the noise when encapsulating. You can basically choose whatever is fastest on your platform. Disadvantages is it's somewhat less robust. So if you do this and somebody at some point in some system employs this and reuses keys, security is down the drain. It's also that if you offer more options to systems designers, then, well, it's more likely that somebody at some point will screw up. So it's a bit of a tricky question. I like to be conservative and robust in the design. So I'm actually now more on the side of saying, well, we should have active security by default. There's just too large of a risk that otherwise things go wrong. And then the final item is if you choose to have active security, there's various tweaks that you can apply to your CCA transform. So to this Fujisaki Okamoto transform, the, the basic idea of forcing Bob to use, um, well, to generate every, uh, all of the random values deterministically from a seed, encrypting the seed over to Alice, Alice checks, that is the same for all of the CAMs except for entry. And then you can apply various tweaks to this. So for example, you can also hash the public key that you're encapsulating to into the coins. And if you're imagining attacker, an attacker trying to exploit failures in some way, then that gives you additional multi-target protection. So then an attacker can't generate ciphertext any more than you can reuse against multiple different users. Um, you can also hash the public key into that shared key that falls out of the chem in the end, which means that the chem becomes contributory. Remember in this overview picture that Bob chose the key K and then sort of encrypted it to Alice. And 
well, if we hash the public key of Alice in there, then Bob can't choose anymore what the final key is. And some people like that, some protocols might be happier to have this contributory behavior. You might also want to hash the ciphertext into that shared key, which some protocols need to do this to, um, well, have the whole context established in that key. Those protocols might want to do this outside of the CAM. Um, you might as well include it in the CAM, cost some additional hashing. Um, it might be more robust. Right? Second question is, how do you actually handle rejection? So what happens if Alice decrypts and then re-encrypts and does and then gets a different ciphertext than what she was ex what, what she received from Bob. So basically when Alice detects that Bob has been cheating. In a theoretic notion you just return a bottom signal uh, signal um, symbol which is just not a key but if you implement this in the real world one way would be to do this through um, return value of that function. So for example, return minus one. Another way is to just compute a secret shared key S, which is the hash of some long-term secret and the ciphertext, which means you're getting an invalid random looking key and then later stages in a protocol will work with this key and will reject. As of round two of the NIST competition, all proposals use the second approach and no proposal used this explicit rejection through the special symbol. Essentially two reasons for this. One is that this is a requirement by some security reductions that just don't work anymore if you do explicit rejection. And it's somewhat more robust in practice because there is, it's not like there is a return value that maybe some implementer just ignores and continues, but you're only revealing things that are secure to work with all the time and you can just proceed in the same way. Okay, let's summarize this in all a little bit. So lattice-based CAMs, I think um, maybe Patrick will um, contradict me here in the next talk, but I think overall they offer the best performance um, for key agreement in the post-quantum world. And in the design there's many, many trade-offs between security, failure rate, size, speed, um, and it's very hard to tell if I show you two reasonably designed lattice-based CAMs, which one is better or worse. It just very much depends on what metric you want to apply. There's also some more information. So um, I included the, the link here to the official website by NIST about the NIST post-quantum standardization effort. I also included a second link, which is a wiki um, by Florida Atlantic University. And I think it's the, the best overview of the NIST candidates um, it collects information about uh, different categories, sizes, and everything in, I think, the most, uh, most accessible way. Okay, that basically concludes my talk.